going to change the way everybody thinks about the new job there, but it's not going to change our mission. We operated on the premise that uh, change was not painful. It was the resistance to change that was painful. One of the most common problems with the operations and systems communications is understanding things of each other's jobs. This is Court to Court, your connection to what's happening in the federal courts around the country, providing information and ideas that will enhance your job and how the courts function. Now with today's program, Michael Burney. Welcome to Court to Court, the Federal Judicial Center's educational magazine program for all court employees. Today we highlight two courts which have begun using case management electronic case filing. We'll also learn more about improving communication skills, this time among systems and operations staff. And Bob Fagan returns with more words to know. The transition to case management electronic case filing is underway in several alpha courts. The changeover remains a work in progress, and the experience of the alpha courts will be widened by those in the next wave of conversion. The District Court for the Northern District of California made a partial transition in early April. We visited the court a week and a half prior to launch. Chief Deputy Clerk Jim Gilmore uses the metaphor of a dinner party to describe the need for flexibility in implementing ECF. This is like hosting and preparing a dinner for about 20 people. You need to have everything sort of come to the table at once so everybody can sit down and begin this feast. And it's tricky like a dinner party is. It's just like having to lay the sauce on the stovetop because taking the oven isn't done. And, and you just have to try not to panic when that happens and try not to pick on the sauce too much. It's a strange metaphor. Systems manager Doug Purcell has a somewhat different way of putting it. Purcell is also the CM ECF project manager. The hardest part of it has been just doing the dance to stay on top of all the other pieces that there are. Tongue in cheek, Purcell says doing that has a price. It means that you don't get as much sleep as you used to and you drink more than you did before. We're getting 25 or 30 um, registration forms a day and we're getting behind. Bob's been doing them all. Um, we can't keep up. Bob is going to come in on Sunday with Doug. Doug's going to come in on every Sunday. As the start date gets nearer, Clerk of Court Rich Wickett and Chief Deputy Clerk Gilmore worry about processing the rush of electronic registrations coming in from attorneys. I don't know how much longer we can do this. I mean, we got the big flood of them after the report room at the Daily Journal articles. So, you know, it went up from about 2 p.m. a day to 25 or 30 a day, and it's still tiny. I don't know. Well, what kind of task can we handle on a regular basis? One person can probably reasonably do a dozen or maybe 20 of these a day. Full time. Of course, we don't have anybody who can do it full time right now. When they first began to think about what CMECF would mean, the managers quickly realized that all staff needed to participate in the changeover. So they held several town hall meetings. Trying to deliver the, the message by this kind of mechanism, but we need you to think about what it will mean too, because there are things we haven't thought of. Managing change often is touted as a worthy goal. But Gilmore says that change management is the least of their problems. There's all this talk about it. It sounds like it's something that you can manage, but you have to make change happen first. And that's the hardest thing in the courts. The organization is not made for change. It's very traditional. So I said that goes well. When I first came here in the 1970s, one of my first jobs was to clean out a storeroom was full of great big heavy glass ink wells and huge jars of shaper ink that people had kept around just in case these typewriter deals didn't work out. From ink wells to a paperless system, in the digital age, some of the pieces can be mysterious. It's a tape-changing device with a little robot that roams around inside picking tapes out of a cartridge and sticking them into the drive. It took me a little while to get up the nerve to even try to open the door when it first arrived. This is backups for the whole of the ECF box, the database itself, and then all of the other bits and pieces that go to make up the application. The hardware is only part of Purcell's challenge. 
show the software to install. You leave yourself plenty of time, but I also have a lot of faith in the folks at SDSD, formerly known as DTSD. Um, their documentation is usually very, very good, and I'm sure that it will be much better when the next wave of tools comes out. Purcell had heard rumors that the software could be installed in two or three days. Right before the frost times and the winter off of documentation, which is not necessarily when this ultimately published form, takes a whole lot longer than two or three days to come in. So it would take you more like six weeks. Initially, the management team thought the docking staff would be most affected by the change, but they discovered that those most affected will be their corporate deputies. Because we are wedded the idea that input happens as close to the source of the document or the event as possible, they will actually, for the first time, gain first time input data into a system. The courtroom deputies expected a year of heartburn with the new responsibilities of the docket room combined with working through the paper for existing cases. But they looked forward to the eventual payoff with no more photocopy for the summoned court orders. In the meantime, they will work out solutions as problems arise. And what about the docket clerk's jobs? My main concern was it won't affect them as they really have a job, and it won't affect them in that way. You know, nobody's going to be losing their job. But it will affect what we do and how we do it. We are still responsible for the docket, but we will not be the people who actually enter things onto the docket. That will happen somewhat quickly in time and zoom. So we're still responsible for something that we're not actually doing yet. That's going to be that's going to require a different way of thinking about what it is, what our product is. Not so much data entry anymore, but more quality control and customer service. You don't have near as much uh, memorization involved, whereas you have to memorize code after code after code before now. Everything is right there on your screen. You just choose. So it actually speeds the process up quite a bit and makes it a lot easier to get your work done. I think the biggest part is just not knowing what to expect. The training kind of gets rid of those fears that you have of the unknown. What do we do if it's um, out of state, Mike? If it's out of state, there's um, two selections at the bottom of the list. It's been really easy to pick up, and um, so I'm not really too apprehensive about the change over. Everyone has a bit of resistance to change, and you can avoid that, but this is definitely going to be for the best, no question. And the court's judges? They <coughs> may tend to uh, postpone or delay really getting involved with a project like this because it seems a little peripheral to their most important sorts of tasks. It was decided that in the San Francisco court, three of the 18 judges would begin taking in cases. In the San Jose division, the six active judges will participate. And in Oakland, one judge will take in final cases. The court began their training with a basic approach. Get their hands on it. Let them feel it. And then let them decide how much of it they're actually going to do. About 80% of the court's cases are settled. ECF will be a big change for the court's outside customers, too. We did a run on our current docking system database and discovered that there are 9,000 attorneys approximately who are part who are parties to cases that are pending now. And they're all over the country, they're all over the world. So we decided let's go ahead and do some type of a web-based tutorial to hopefully get the training out to the attorneys. So that's why we took a look at um, the FOC's tutorial to see will that, will that meet our needs. With a few modifications to the FJC template, the tutorial is now a key element of the court's ECF website and training for the bar. We've gotten some feedback from attorneys who have been using the, the tutorial, and so far the, the feedback that we've gotten is that it's pretty positive. They feel that it's fairly easy to use the tutorial. Despite the notices on the court's website, project manager Doug Purcell says they now realize that they should have advertised the changeover to ECF sooner and advertised it in print. When the court held a news conference two weeks prior to the launch date, ECF ran the front pages of two local trade papers. It was obvious that the medium was still very, very significant because there was a whole lot of people all over the county who were either doing print and were doing it when, and I have finally found out then, some few weeks in advance of the so-called live date, that this was actually going on because we didn't know it was going until they showed up on the front page of the newspaper. 
surprisingly old fashioned in the uh, following. You know, they don't have anything for anybody to look at yet. We can't recommend stopping the main catalog of the court works as it moves through the process. It helps to inform uh, you know, your later decision making and expedites uh, you know, that and minimizes the effort you have to put into bringing a thing in the past. Since going live in early April, the Northern California District Court reports that the transition is going reasonably well. In the first two months, 200 cases were designated for e-filing. The court says that coming to terms with the mechanics of the software is fairly easy. More difficult and longer term, both for the bar and the court, are the implications of changing how one does one's work. The Center's ECF tutorial for district courts is available on our DCN website. It's a lengthy address, so bear with me. The address is http colon backslash backslash 156.132.47.230 backslash cbd backslash ecf22 backslash index.html. The address for the bankruptcy court tutorial is slightly different. Replace the ecf22 ECFBEBEB01. The rest of the address stays the same. Still ahead on Court to Court, we'll hear from the Bankruptcy Court in the Western District of North Carolina about its experience converting to electronic case management. We'll learn the meanings of several legal terms, and we'll get some tips on improving communication between systems and operations. Another CMECF Alpha Court began its journey into the new system of electronic case management. The Bankruptcy Court in the Western District of North Carolina said goodbye to MANCAP, the Bankruptcy Case Automation Private Docketing System, early in March. We visited the Charlotte Division several weeks after that and learned how the court dealt with the fears that ECF can create. The fears I had about CMECF coming to this district were that it would not be as reliable as the system that we now have fears that I had were that um, it would possibly reduce my, my workload, um, and if that happened, then I might work myself out of a job. I guess one of the biggest fears I had was that we would have to greatly uh, modify the way we operate. Number one, that I would break the machine. Number two, that everything I put in would disappear. And number three, that I wouldn't even be able to understand it. The system that I had grown accustomed to for the many years of being here, I knew would become extinct. Um, so I would have to learn a whole new system again. I think my first reaction was the same as everyone else's fear and resistance to change. So why would a court volunteer to put itself through this sooner rather than later? Our belief is that uh, CMECF is absolutely essential for us to be able to keep up with the caseload that we've got. The court considers 7,000 cases a year. The numbers keep going up, and the court knows that the new technology will help manage this ever-increasing caseload. But with its shared location in an historic building, the bankruptcy court has another urgent, albeit low-tech, reason to convert to CMECF. Well, the record is there. They're really a mess. We have no space. We have absolutely no space in the basement. There's no case probably to be closed. And on our shelves any longer than four months. We're probably shipping the archives at least 100 boxes every four months or less. More important, though, it, it provides um, a great enhancement to our service to the people who use the court. We file hundreds of documents a day. I'm a Chapter 13 trustee and in a location that's remote from Charlotte, so I can't just get in my car and drive down the block and go to the clerk's office. So the, the ability to file remotely is greatly we will be able to docket and file documents in an efficient manner, and that we will be able to run reports that are useful to our office. I think it will be wonderful. I think we can take a laptop computer and literally have our whole office at our fingertips. Most alpha courts agree that the preparation prior to going live is critical, but there's 
no standard version of how to prepare. Each court follows its own style. <laughs> In fact, for the Western District of North Carolina Bankruptcy Court, it's the self-directed team management of the staff. Almost everybody in my court's involved. jump in with both feet, just like the staff did. We did the same training exercises. Rhonda Cherkis, the case administrator in the Asheville Division, became one of the court's trainers. Again, the great thing about adding case flags is it's versatile. You can add a flag at the same time you're removing a flag. The top box is going to enable you to set a flag. She emphasizes showing people how CFDCF will benefit them directly. Once they have an incentive, then you're going to overcome that fear by replacing it with training, knowledge, and information. How would that help you or assist you in the administration in a day-to-day -day, uh, situation? You would firmer. It would help us by getting the cases closed and discharged in a timely manner. It would also help identify if we need to docket a receipt. We get this committed to lots of training thus far, so that is kind of getting you used to the new system. Some refusal to sign it. The terrific thing about editing case data is now you're actually editing information that's in the system as opposed to making a notation on the docket. Courtney Deputy Sean Bicey from the Asheville Division is also responsible for docketing. She can hear that CFECF will put her on the job. And as the attorneys are using our system more and more, then I will be doing less inputting and more reviewing. But I will review them before we send input. So actually, the workload will not go down, it will only change. Training does overcome fears, but training has its own challenges. I would say the biggest challenge to staff training is the period of time that takes place between when structured training stops and when going live begins. It's what I call the reinforcement period. You have to make sure that those skills are continually reinforced so that the staff maintains a high confidence level and, and a comfort level with the system. In our court, we've met that challenge by preparing weekly exercises for the staff. In a particular topic area that we felt um, could use some reinforcement. If you're checking a case, you'll want to be sure to check to make sure that accounting is shown when you're performing your data quality assurance. The court went live with the case management part of CMECF on March 5th. She delayed the electronic filing part of the system so has begun to train outside users on the reasoning. We wanted to know the system very well before we went out and start training others. Your filing date, you never can mess with that because it's always going to be today's date. So whenever you go to enter in this petition at your office, it's not going to be entered until the date that you actually enter it. You'll never be able to change that date. Case Administrator Lucretia Sullivan also volunteered to be a trainer. She says comfort and familiarity are factors in training users from outside the court. Number one, we want to make the training as painless as possible. We want it to be smooth. Your country, your phone, fax, and email are all optional information. If you choose to put that in, then that's your decision, but it's not required for CMECF. Sullivan, who also trains court staff, says she taught herself a great deal about CMECF by repeatedly working in the training database whenever she had have spent a great deal of time and they, they have the ability to translate their training into layman's terms. I know very little about computers, but they can speak my language. So what we want to do is we want to review this information before we submit the transaction. And this is a habit that you definitely need to get into when you start doing CMECF. In March, when the court switched from ADCAP to electronic case management, Judge Hodges passed that no paper files ever again be brought into this courtroom. The mayor has not told the clerk It's easy to understand why. The week before court, I would start pulling files off the shelves and making sure that each document that the judge need, might need to review was tagged for the judge's review. And I had to make sure that those documents and the 
Charles Murray Order, um, in the order that the case is going to be called on the docket. I don't even know that I have to do any of that. Case number 144, J. Craig Whitley, hearing on motion for relief from stay of City National Bank, debtor's response. As Lacey pulls up each file, it's immediately available on Judge Lundy's screen. Court to court is there on a Chapter 13 motion day. By lunchtime, Judge Hodges has heard more than 120 motions. The inmate does not have a file in the courtroom during the whole process. Sam McSam has had all those files there and read over them. So it's what's remarkable is that the court has had a 33% increase in new cases during the first three months of electronic case management. There's much to do, but after going live, says the court's ECF coordinator, Aaron Devlin. Keep everyone informed internally and externally as much as possible. Continue to have regular committee meetings to be sure everyone's on task and train, train, train. Then you can go back to your docket report, click on the report hypertext link, and choose docket report. And don't be too proud to ask for help. There's probably another court out there that has already experienced what you're going through and probably already has a solution or a workaround. Now, once you submit it, you're going to get a, a notice of electronic filing verification screen. Since we visited the Western District of North Carolina Bankruptcy Court, it has begun accepting electronically filed documents. Our Terry Crockett and her staff say that the work of the court in checking these entries is time well spent toward the goal of creating a well-trained attorney base. Many viewers have told us they'd like to hear more Latin phrases explained, so we're going to do another one today, and a couple of other terms that several of you have requested. Here with words to know is my colleague, Bob Fagan. We just can't escape Latin in the law, but we wouldn't want you to confuse the prima facie with the first course at an Italian restaurant. Prima facie literally means at first sight, or on the first appearance, or on the face of it. Most often you'll hear it used as prima facie case or prima facie evidence. A prima facie case is one that is sufficient to prevail unless it is contradicted by other evidence. Courts use the phrase prima facie case in two ways. First, it means that based on the plaintiff's evidence alone, a jury could reasonably find for the plaintiff. If the jury could not so find, the plaintiff has failed to present a prima facie case. Sometimes, courts also use the phrase prima facie case to mean that the plaintiff's evidence compels, not just permits, a finding in the plaintiff's favor if the defendant did not produce evidence to rebut it. The other phrase the courts use is prima facie evidence, sometimes called presumptive evidence. Prima facie evidence is evidence that by itself is presumed to establish a fact unless some other evidence is presented to rebut or disprove it. For example, a legal marriage license is prima facie evidence that two individuals are married. Also, a signed post office receipt of delivery is prima facie evidence that a letter or package has been delivered. Such evidence would be adequate to infer a given fact or facts which make up a party's claim or defense. If it is not rebutted, prima facie evidence will remain sufficient to sustain a finding in favor of the issue it supports. Another set of terms that many of you have asked about is dismissal without prejudice and dismissal with prejudice. Dismissal without prejudice simply means that the plaintiff, the person who has brought suit against someone else, has the right to sue again or file another motion for the same cause of action at a later date. The specific words without prejudice mean a judge's decree of dismissal does not prevent a later suit. Without prejudice declares that no rights or privileges of a plaintiff or defendant are considered waived or lost. In situations of a dismissal with prejudice, the plaintiff does not have the right to bring or maintain an action for the same claim or cause. A dismissal with prejudice generally means adjudication on the merits and final disposition. Our extra word today is no, not Latin, but French, en banc. Or you'll also hear it said in bank. Regardless of how it's pronounced, en banc means a full bench. It refers to a session in which all of the judges in the court are present and participate in a matter. In district and bankruptcy courts, these would be ceremonial matters. In appellate courts, these could be decisions as well. The Supreme Court always sits en banc. U.S. Courts of Appeal usually sit in panels of three judges, but on 
rare occasions, a court will hear a case, perhaps an exceptionally important one, on bond. Or a court will rehear a case on bond, as a regular three-judge panel has already decided. But that's also very rare. For an on bond hearing, all the judges of the court in active status participate. And senior judges may also, if they have been involved in the case earlier. The Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit uses a statutory provision authorizing large appellate courts to form what's called a limited en banc. In the Ninth Circuit, an en banc is the chief judge and ten other judges selected by law. An example of an en banc hearing came in the Microsoft case in the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The June 13, 2000 order states that the case would be heard en banc in view of the exceptional importance of these cases and the fact that the number of judges of this court disqualified from participation as a practical possibility precludes any en banc rehearing of a panel decision. So judges recusing themselves may also lead to an en banc stay. The court's language has an amazing heritage. Words and phrases from many languages enrich our work environment and everyday vocabulary. That's words to know for this time. I'll see you in the future, court to court. In each of the ECF Alpha courts we've heard from today, the implementation team is headed by a person from systems. As the courts become ever more reliant on technology, the interaction between systems and operations staffs grows in importance. As we'll hear in our next segment, there are ways to make the exchange smoother. Like virtually every other court, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit finds that when operations and systems staff communicate, they often encounter basic differences. Issues that we have with operations staff and technical staff, are the, the two groups really have different types of expertise and they speak different languages. One of the most common problems with the operations and systems communications is understanding things of each other's job. Um, Mr. Duncan? People do not understand what the mutual systems want and systems don't understand what they're implementing. Sometimes it's just best to ignore each other because they don't want to hear the other one talk and therefore you have an edge. Right, so it's a basic piece of that. It's real easy since we're all down here in Bristol and we all live there to get isolated sometimes. You have to make an effort to not let that happen, to be able to let people know that we're all in this together and we're not just sort of us versus them all the time. If you know what they need to hear, Expressing what you want or need so that they'll understand why you want it and if they need it. It's a matter of rephrasing it. I guess it's that fear where it'll say where it's from. Sometimes they'll say court unknown. And it's like, you yeah. have to know it was an open right. or else they're picking up some sort of weird district bankruptcy, which isn't what it's supposed to be. Operations manager Gary Curtis remembers an experience in which one of the system staff went on his own initiative to discuss an issue with the document staff. No one had ever done that before, and we were all a little concerned about how the communications would go. But our, after uh, him and Ms. Lynn took time, they did start to communicate and start to exchange ideas. So I think starting to see the systems person as a person who wanted to make things work, and systems people began to see some of the difficulties the document faced in getting their job done, and they were able to look at each other and they became equal with faces instead of names. It's face to face meeting at this time that takes uh, is a voice that you hear uh, so often in SISA on a daily basis you can only see each other that much. Now for uh, Dr. Easterling and for some reason the uh, systems uh, region communication is just important because uh, you get a good read on each other's uh, work. Mike Curtis was thinking about uh, uh, not being able to uh, I think the understanding, trust, and respect for one another's work is vital. Clerk of Court Kathy Patterson strives for inclusion of the system staff. We try to foster that just by um, letting them know that they're vital members of the team. They're not just the people who just live in the basement um, next to the machines. We don't generate any of the opinions down here, although we certainly have many opinions. We merely provide tools that help uh, the lawyers here do research turn help the judges get the information they need to make their, their decisions. Well, one of the biggest problems that we found, it does not have to do with Dr. Yang, but what it has to actually to do with is that um, once the uh, court orders the case to be taken in bank or reopens it for any reason, um, 
Michael Siegel was the presenter. Please check into the special room. The sire of large blocks of uninterrupted time is awakened too soon. What really turns them on was just to work on the technology. Now, the challenge with it is that the ports don't necessarily operate that way. The ports tend to have a rhythm of their own, which may or may not be consistent with large blocks of concentrated time. Siegel acknowledged that Adam Hatch's that desire with the port sequence must be negotiated. There are no silver bullets. He also encouraged managers to include system staff in other porting issues. These are sharp people. They're smart. And they're good analytically. And involving them in issues other than automation, number one, you get good ideas. Number two, you get their buy-in into the enterprise. And finally, of course, customer service skills, that the business they're in is not the technology business, the business they're in is justice. And, and technology is only effective to the extent that it supports the delivery of justice. Court of Appeals Clerk Kathy Cabison emphasizes who are the customers of the system staff. The customer service goes beyond just the, the public and the judges, it's got to be the entire clerk's office staff. That, of course, means communicating with one another. And not necessarily through email, even though that may be their preferred way of communicating. It's not always the best way to communicate. It's sometimes much better if you actually come meet with them one on one. I would say the biggest problem that we have that requires the greatest amount of work is when someone calls and says, I'm having a problem, the system is broken. The department wants operation staff to be as specific as possible and to give as many clues as possible. And then we want them to sort of trust us to work on it and try to make it right. And the, the trust part is something we have to earn from them, and we try to do that. McFarland named it an anomaly because prior to transferring to systems, he was a doctor clerk for 10 years. I know what the frustrations that they have when they're completely powerless to affect what happens down the road. And I, I like to be an advocate for their side of the thing. Not every court can be so fortunate as to have someone who can do both technical and operations jobs, but this court suggests there are ways to foster understanding among the two groups. If you don't have someone in the technical group who has experience in docketing, I think it's probably a real worthwhile thing to make arrangements and have them go up and sit and do that job for a month. And likewise, have someone come from docketing and sit and work with the technical people for a month. It doesn't hurt to have them to sit down with each other and maybe one day just look over someone's shoulder and just say exactly what we're going through if you want us to put themselves in that person's shoes. That's all for today. We'd like to know your evaluation of the program. You can contact us at the address on the screen. Click on court to court, select online evaluation, print the form, and fill it out. We also would like to